Hey everyone, we're interrupting our move to bring you some Threadripper 2 news. So in this one, everyone else will be posting specs and prices. We've got those too, but we also have some extra information, not too much about the architecture side, and well, more of the topology of how Threadripper 2 is arranged under the IHS. We'll be talking about that a bit today, showing a topological diagram of Threadripper 2, basically a block diagram, talking about the specs and prices, and then we'll get back to moving into our new office. Before that, this video is brought to you by NZXT's new H500 case, which we recently found to have an impressively effective cooling setup that is entirely negative pressure when stock. The H500 is the successor of the S340 and S340 Elite, offering high build quality that's all steel and glass, and cable management features that are also top class for this $70 compact mid-tower case. The H500 is a part of NZXT's new H-Series lineup, which also features options for Mini-ITX, micro ATX and full ATX builds. Learn more at the link in the description below. So the quick basics here, just like with Ryzen 2000 series, we're not technically working with AMD on this launch. Uh, they did not provide any documentation, although at the last hour they did offer, uh, we ended up getting all of our information elsewhere. So not, not technically working with them on this one. But uh, out of respect for everyone else, we'll keep the information we do have mostly limited to what's lifting that embargo, although uh, keep in mind, I don't 100% know what's under embargo and what isn't because I wasn't part of the meeting. So uh, anyway, we've got some news for you and uh, might have some testing later on. Just depends on how things work out with the move. So first thing here, the configuration, AMD's got a few processors. We'll go over those in a minute. The 2990WX is probably the most interesting. It's the flagship Halo product. It's pretty high. It's their highest end processor, 32 cores, 64 threads. We'll talk about that more momentarily. And this one uses the cores enabled in all dies. So that's the most interesting part of this is with, I'm looking for my original Threadripper uh, diagram, but our original Threadripper diagram showed how just two of the dies out of four actually have active cores. And that was true for the entire 1900 series. So with this one, the 2990WX is moving to four active dies and it has cores across all four of them. We'll talk about the topology too. That's, it's kind of interesting because two of the dies are basically IO controllers and the other two are connected via Infinity Fabric, basically just an interconnect. So that's the 2990WX and this one more or less confirms Der Bauer's findings where uh, he got into a, a bit of a battle with AMD earlier this year about whether Threadripper had just deactivated dies that could potentially be usable via Epic. So more or less confirms those findings. 2950 WX or 2950X rather than the 2920X are the successors to the existing 1920 and 1950X in terms of the core and thread count. And these will be using dies zero and one, leaving the other two unutilized just like the original threader for one launch. No changes there. I think we were pretty sure it's even going to be the same dies, which would be nice because that means that anyone who had uh, special flow plates for liquid cooling won't have to change the configurations, EK included. And improvements over Threader for One include more of the same stuff we saw for the Ryzen 2000 CPUs on the Zen Plus architecture, not to be confused with Zen 2, and Ryzen 2000, not to be confused with Zen 2 as well. So uh, more of the same stuff. This includes cache latency drops. They've dropped cache latency about 15% on L3 cache, 9% on L2 cache, and 8% on L1 cache. And DRAM latency was also reduced by about 2% with an increase in official JEDEC supported speeds to 2933 megahertz from 2666 megahertz previously. Again, that's official JEDEC support, not to be confused with maximum memory support. So you can clock higher, but that's the official JEDEC support, which means that overall memory um, uh, compatibility would be improved over Threader for one, just like with Ryzen 2000 series where you had motherboards uh, like X470 primarily improving their BIOS and memory timings and auto timings, uh, you'll see more of that in Threadripper 2 as well. So here's an image we made that shows AMD's Threadripper 2 SoC topology. It's not much different than the 1950X at its core. This is the 2950X using two memory channels to connect dies to memory, 32 PCIe lanes each, and I.O. operating at 50 gigabits per second with a 1600 megahertz memory clock assumed. Cores 0 through 15 are on die 0 in the diagram, with cores 16 to 31 on die 1. 
In theory, AMD is enabling the same two dies in every single processor individually, so hotspots shouldn't change in TR2 between TR2 CPUs. This is good news again for cooling manufacturers. As for the memory channels, like with Threadripper 1, these can be pooled into a single UMA or UMA domain rather than two NUMA domains. This is user configurable and depends on whether you want latency for gaming or pools for production. Local mode, or NUMA, is useful for reducing memory latency, like in games, while UMA, or UMA, is ideal for even spread of memory hits across the channels, basically distributing the transactions. This image shows the 2990WX block diagram. It's not too different, but gets a bit more complex when given the extra two dies. Dies 0 and 2 hold the direct buses to PCIe and DDR, with dies 3 and 1 simply sitting between Infinity Fabric lines to the main IO controller dies. Threadripper 2 will be on 12 nanometer LP or leading performance. This is largely what enables clock speed increases that were seen in Ryzen 2000 and has been carried over to Threadripper 2. And also as a note, the TR4 socket will remain compatible. CPU specs and pricing then, the stuff that you'll probably have seen by now. These are, there are a few of them this time, more than the last time. So the 2920X is a 12 core 24 thread part that replaces the 1920X directly in core count. 3.5 to 4.3 gigahertz with XFR2, 3.5 base, 650 bucks for that one. So this most immediately replaces the 1920X, which for reference is presently $520, about 130 bucks more. Has the same core and thread count, but has some frequency changes, latency changes to cache and better JEDEC memory support. This runs, uh, the 1920X that is runs up to 4.2 gigahertz, and the uh, 2920X will ship in October. 2950X, this is 16 cores, 32 threads. We should have a table somewhere on the screen eventually. And this one runs 3.5 gigahertz base to 4.4 gigahertz XFR, 900 bucks, and replaces the 1950X of the same core count. It's $100 cheaper than the 1950X launch price, but currently the 1950X is around $780 today. So it's significantly cheaper, it's just you lose a lot of the gains. And some of those gains include the frequency where the 1950X capped at 4.0 gigahertz, and you could boost it a bit more manually via XFR or via manual overclocking, but that's about where it's at. This one ships sooner, it ships in August. The 2970WX 24 core 48 thread processor, 3.0 gigahertz base to 4.2 gigahertz boost, $1,300, and this is a new CPU line for AMD, it ships in October. And finally, 2990WX is the Halo product. This one is 32 core, 64 threads, 3.0 gigahertz base, 4.2 gigahertz boost, $1,800, ships August 8th, I believe and 64 PCIe lanes on this one. Still quad channel, runs four by 213 millimeter squared dies, 250 watt TDP on this one. So speaking of TDP, Andy's formula for calculating TDP is a bit different than Intel and Nvidia. Doesn't mean any one of them is necessarily wrong. It's just that they all do it a different way. So uh, this one for AMD, they calculate it for the 2950X, which is listed uh, as 180 watt TDP. They calculate it as follows. TDP in watts equals T case, degrees Celsius minus T ambient degrees Celsius divided by the heatsink fan thermal resistance. So just to be clear, uh, T case is the case temperature as reported in some software monitoring tools as opposed to T junction, which is the one that we normally care about more. T case is going to be your uh, basically your IHS temperature. The T ambient measurement is the ambient temperature and then the heatsink fan thermal resistance is shown as degrees Celsius per watt. So AMD calculates its 180 watt TDP by taking a 56 degree assumed optimal processor te lid temperature for the IHS and subtracting a 32 degree pretty high ambient temperature, if we're honest, and then calculates versus a 0.133 thermal resistance, which they have deemed to be more or less optimal. So that's how they calculate it. We'll talk more about this later. As for TCTL, same as last time, it's a 27 degree offset, just like Threader for one. And then performance metrics here, so despite AMD making a huge fuss about media testing games at 1080p last year, for some reason, I guess they'd, they'd forgotten what it was like to work with media at that point, can't blame them too much, AMD is now testing at 1080p themselves. So uh, AMD's performance lab and notes do note that their gaming test suite was done at 1080p. Go figure, that's how you show a difference. And regardless, AMD showed on average about a 6% decline versus Intel when comparing for similarly priced parts. This is actually pretty damn good for AMD. We obviously, we have to independently validate it. If we ever do, other people will if we don't. But Let's just take them at their word for right now. It was over a pretty big suite of games. They looked okay. We, we looked at their game suite, and honestly, it doesn't seem like they're trying to pull one over on anyone. 
which is cool because it's not often that a company will show any downsides, even if they're minor and even if they're outside of the use cases. So processor is clearly meant to be used for production and they went forward with the gaming test anyway, showed a 6% decline and we're okay. We actually, I'm pretty happy to see that they, uh, they did that. That takes, it takes some courage to do that. 6% though, not bad at all if we take them at their word because you're considering going up against uh, Intel and gaming. They've had a lead and he's gaining there. And then Andy has theoretically should have a lead with Threat Over 2 and a lot of production tasks like Handbrake, Blender, uh, Cinebench, if that matters to you, Cinema 4D, stuff that actually uses the thread count. So they've got potentially big advantages in production departments where they're targeting with not a huge loss in gaming. And then, of course, uh, that is taking all the documentation at its word. But we did look it over, and it seems actually pretty fair overall. We looked through all the endnotes, all the testing suites, and all that stuff, and it looked not bad. So wait for independent analysis, but uh, honestly, pretty good looking overall so far. So other performance figures. AMD is using an H100i CLC closed loop cooler. It's actually not one of the, it's, it's pretty good. Depending on if they were at max fan speed or not is kind of the question. We have to assume they likely are because that's just, I mean, that's how we would do the testing. It makes sense. And, uh, and it is a high TDP part. So either way though, H100i CLC is a 240 millimeter closed loop liquid cooler. Not one of the best on the market. The fact that they're able to use that on a 2950X and a 2990WX for stock testing shows that despite higher TDP, thermals might actually be pretty under control. So it is going to be a hot processor. All of these will be hot processors, relatively speaking to the rest of the market. But uh, an H100i CLC is promising. It's just a question of whether it's max fan speed or not, because then you're talking like 50 plus decibels, which most people don't want to tolerate on a part. So uh, fortunately, you can solve that with mostly a 280 CLC and lower fan speeds. So anyway, it looks good overall. It's just wait around for independent analysis, hold pre-orders, stuff like that. Thermals should be more or less under controlled if you're controlling for voltages. And then motherboard support to be determined. The X399 creation is probably the best one we've seen so far and ASUS looks like they're sticking with their existing boards, which they're going to be shipping optional VRM cooling brackets for those because the VRMs will get really hot if you actually overclock Threadripper 2 uh, as opposed to running it stock where it should be mostly okay. So that's it for the Threadripper 2 news. Not clear on what's embargoed and what's not. AMD did reach out last minute. They uh, didn't send any documentation over. We got it separately and we'll, we'll be looking at potentially sourcing parts as well, whether we buy them or have them shipped via third parties, not sure yet, still moving to the office, but uh, so no promises on if we're covering this particular product on a bench, but we'll probably be testing some of the Threadripper 2 parts, it's just we're not sure which ones, and some of them come out in October, mind you, so maybe look more for those. Uh, anyway, that's it for this one. Subscribe for more as always. The move is still going on. We're posting more moving videos. The David Cantor interview where we talk about 10 nanometers coming up, probably pushing that out to Wednesday, most likely. And then go to store.gamersnexus.net to pick up one of our mod mats. We still have a few in stock. They're shipping really fast, so thank you for the support. Uh, if you buy it today, like as in when this video goes live, you'll definitely get one shipped. And then uh, our posters, video card posters for Video Card Anatomy are still in the store as well. Patreon.com slash GamersNexus helps out directly there for bonus behind the scenes videos. I'll see you all next time.